Welcome to this session on Wood to Back in France. My name is Bruno Gonsalves. I am currently a Muslim Data Science Fellow at the uh, uh, New York University in New York, Manhattan. My background is actually in physics and computer science. So I started being a physicist, working on spin glasses and optimization processes. And then I gradually switched over from spin glasses to complex networks and complex systems, which basically means I used uh, statistical physics, uh, statistical mechanics to study how individual particles and individual uh, components of a system interact together to create the whole system. And eventually, through there, I gradually drifted over to more towards data science, which is what, what I'm doing now. And I'm particularly interested in how we can use different types of data sets and different types of uh, online tools to study human behavior, particularly by using large sets of data from online social networks and combining those not only with classic or more classic complex systems methodologies, but also with more modern and more recent machine learning and neural network approaches. So as I mentioned in the beginning, today I will talk to you a little bit about work to back and friends, or, or rather work to back and related algorithms. Work to back is a relatively recent algorithm that was introduced around 2013 by Nikolov, which was working at Google at the time. And it allows you basically to train a, a neural network that at the end, what you obtain are basically vector embeddings of the words that in your text. And these vector embeddings are very special. You will see that in a second. So let's get started. So as I mentioned, the, the topic today is work to back and friends. Uh, and the idea is, can we teach machines how to read? Can we, or in another way, can we develop a neural network model that will allow us to uh, explore and learn the different semantic behavior and the different semantic components of, of text in the, real, in the real world and doing this in an automatic unsupervised way. And everybody knows that computers are really good at crunching numbers, but not so much when it comes to words. One approach is that we can take is perhaps we can represent words numerically. Can we create a, a numerical representation that, that computers can understand better? The, one of the classical approaches of doing this is you just assign an ID to each word. So what this means is each word gets assigned a number. The problem with this is, or at least uh, one of the problems with this is that since computers interpret numbers literally, they, they necessarily, and of course naturally, assume that the, the number two is close to the number one and the number three and far from the number 14. But of course, as you can see in this table, that doesn't necessarily mean that the word corresponding to number one, which in this case is A, is necessarily a bit closer or farther away from the, from the word uh, number 14, the word pass. So another approach that people came up with is called one hot encoding. And what this means is you still have this list of words. You, you have basically your vocabulary. The vocabulary, is represented as having a size or a length of V. And you have this long vector of V components that is zero everywhere, except in one position. And that's the position that represents that specific word. So here we have the vector for the word after, which was in the fourth position, and the vector for the word above, which is in the third position. So those are the only two elements that are, that are hot in this representation that, that are signaled as one instead of zero. Now the question is, can we also not only represent them in this way, but also can we do it in a way that, that preserves semantic information, right? that presents some type of idea about the meaning of the word and what the, what the word represents. Here in this representation, basically what we have is a v-dimensional space. And in this space, uh, since all the words are exactly one unit away from the origin. What this means is all the words are equally distant from each other. But they all represent uh, different dimensions in this space. Now, uh, in the 1950s, uh, Joseph Firth, which you're showing, showing here in the, in the photo, 
had this interesting quote that basically represents one of the intuitions in that is coming in linguistics, as you shall know, where by the company it keeps. Now, what this means is that you can understand in many ways what is the meaning of a word by looking at the words around it, like the context in which, in which it appears. And this concept of words and concepts in which they appear will, will be very important throughout the rest of this talk. So let's see an example. The idea that, then is that words that have similar meanings are used in similar contexts. And the context in which a word is used helps us understand what the meaning is. So here's a couple of examples. So you can you can see just from the, the first few sentences that houses can be red or blue, they can be beautiful or old, but so can cars. Right? The red the red house is beautiful, the blue house is old, the red car is beautiful, the blue car is old. And if you were to train a mod, a very simple model of just these four sentences, you'd learn that houses and cars are very similar, right? Because they appear in exactly the same context. You might also, because and this is of course due to the fact that the data set is very small, you might also pick up extraneous um, correlations, but right? you might you might find out or uh, discover that red is always beautiful and blue is always old because these two words always appear next to each other. And that's and that's not of course not true. And the, the reason uh, rather the way in which we overcome this is by using the extremely large data sets. Right? The larger the better. And the, in fact there is a, a result I read in a paper recently where where they showed basically that simply using twice as much data and training it just for a single single epoch, so just going through the, the data set once, if the data set is twice the original size, is better than going through the, the original data set three or four times. So not only do you save time in training, because you're, you're, you're training less in a sense, you're only just doing two n instead of five, four or five n, but you're actually getting more information. And of course, the reason for this is very simple, is you, since you have a large, a larger corpuses, you're capturing more more possible combinations, you're capturing more of the possibilities that are actually present in the real world. So but that was just a small detail. So but this is to just to assert the idea that you can learn the meaning of the word looking at the context and you can figure out what the context is. Maybe you can even figure out what the context should be based on the word. If we're talking about houses, the words you would use around houses are very different perhaps than the words you'd use if you're talking about uh, people or food. So, the slide. Yeah. <clears throat> so, what, so, what this implies in practice when we're trying to develop a model that is able to, to capture this automatically in an uh, unsupervised way. So, unsupervised basically, basically means that you don't have to define what is what is true and what is not. Really. You just feed the data to the to the model and let it learn by itself, is that words with similar meaning should have similar representations. And so as we saw before, in the case of one hot encoding, even very similar words like uh, now uh, and rather like blue and red would have completely different representations. They would have the one in completely different positions then and would be basically at the same distance then there would be words that are completely different, like the word machine and the word company. And, then, and also from a word, we should be able to get some idea about the context where it might appear. Right? So if I just show you these two, these two words and the, and the slots for the, the words around it, you might be able to come up with reasonable sentences that, are, that describe a house or a car. Well, if I do the, the opposite game, and this is probably one of the childhood games you, you played when you were, when you were a child, is you, you can guess more or less what are the possible words that are in those gaps. So you, you could guess that the right house is beautiful and the blue car is old. Now, and what this means mathematically is on one hand, on the first case, from the, from the word guessing the context, what you're trying to do somehow is maximizing what is the probability of observing a single, a, a given context, given the word. So that's how you, it's represented mathematically by this conditional probability, P of C given W, given w that is the word C for context. Well, in the opposite, what you have is the opposite problem, or the opposite expression. You have the probability 
of the world given the context, right? So given this context, what is the most likely world that you go there, or at least the list of most likely worlds. Let's keep on there. And basically this was inspiration for Nicola in 2013 when he published the work back, the, the paper and the algorithm. And what, and basically we came up with two different types of models, and two related models that kind of correspond to these two ways of looking at the problem. You can say, given the word, guess what is the context. And so maximize the probability of the context given the word. And, and that's called skip gram. And that's the, this here on the left. On the other hand, you have something called the, the continuous bag of words that's saying, given the context, guess what is the word that's missing. And of course, here I'm only showing you two words of context, the word before and the word after. That's what I mean by wj plus one and wj minus one with respect, respect to wj. wj, of course, is the word that we are interested in at the given point in time. wj minus one would be the word immediately before, wj plus one would be the, the word immediately after, if you think of text as being a, a, a linear sequence. <clears throat> and though, of course, here I'm only showing you two, but the window can be arbitrarily large. You can have minus 10 words on one side and, and 10 words on the other side. One thing that, that's also important to note here is that this is a this is what is known as a shallow neural network. What you have is you have the input layer, which you, which in the case of skip gram is represented by, by the WJ. In the case of continuous bag of words is the J plus one J, J minus one. So in one case is a word that appears the context. You have a first layer that you are not directly with, with sigma that corresponds basically to what the first type of processing you do on the on input, and then you have the output layer that in the in the skip gram case would be the context you're trying to guess. Look at this bag of words is the word you're trying to guess. <clears throat> One thing that it's also important to notice, and I'll mention this again in a, in a second when we're looking at this in, in more detail, is that the connections between the, the input layer and the hidden layer, so the kind of thing here is omega one on the skip gram, and between the hidden layer and the output layer, omega one, in the continuous bag of words, this is what we call the embeddings. Usually it's what we represent all those embeddings. In practice, the omega twos, which are the, the connections between the hidden layer and the context, are also in a sense embeddings, but these are the embeddings of the context. So they are slightly different. Not too different, of course, but they are, they are slightly different, and they're and they're not the ones you use when you say you're using word embedding. So continue. Uh, so as I was saying, theta one are the word embeddings, theta two are the context embeddings. Wj here is the one hot vector for the word in position j of the sequence of text, and the sigma is just the activation function, which in the which in the case of the two vector is actually linear. So the, the function just repeats the, the input it receives, rather than the linear combination of input it receives. So instead of keeping going back and forth between the two types of models, let's focus instead on the, on the single model. Let's focus on the skip ground case, just to clarify things. And let's simplify it a little bit and say that we have one word, and we're trying to predict exactly what is the next word. It's at the end, right? So instead of having two or four or, or 20 words that are in predict, then predict just one. This will simplify the math a little bit and make it easier for us to understand. <clears throat> As I mentioned, words are one hot uh, vectors, and this is both for the input and for the, and for the content. Uh, theta one is the n times v uh, uh, matrix. So what this means, so n is the number of hidden, hidden units. V is the number, number of vocabularies. So basically, the length of words. And so, when you take this product of theta one times omega j, you're basically selecting the jth column of, of, of theta one. And this is this will be basically the input we're given is this embedded word, not not anymore this long. Uh, vector of ones and zeros of length v, but now this much shorter vector of, of dimension m. And then in the, 
uh, since we have a linear activation uh, function, this just move, move it along. And then at the next step, what, what we're doing is we're multiplying this by, by theta 2, which is a v times n matrix. So when we multiply it, we get back a large uh, v-dimensional v vector. And so if, if you think about it a, a little bit, the math can get a, a little bit tricky, especially if you're not used to linear algebra. You can easily convince yourself that each element k of the output layer is then given by ukt uh, times vj. Now, the v I'm using is a representation of the vector that you get after you multiply uh, theta 1 and, and uh, wj, while the, the uk values is basically one of the rows of the theta 2 matrix. And this is just in the dot product. Now, in fact, what, what we get out of this is a, is a series of numbers, which is the, basically the overlap between the word embedding and the, on one side and the context embedding on the other side. And this will give you some number. And what we want instead is actually to get some type of probability. So we want to say it's 90% likely that this is the word we should be expecting, and it's 10% likely it's this other word. And the way to do this is we convert this to a normalized probability distribution by using the softmax function. And then, and then we compare the output of the softmax function with the actual context we were expecting. So I, I squeezed in the, the softmax layer over there, just to make it clear. So softmax is a standard way of converting a set of numbers to a normalized probability distribution. So you just take the exponential of each value and then you divide by the, by the sum to normalize it. When you have this final ingredient, then what you get is is finally your mathematical definition of what is the probability of having one word in the context given that you have this word in the input. And then this is just a, a soft max of the product of these two vectors, which is the exponential of these two vectors over the normalization. So then our, our goal, of course, is to learn the values of, of theta 1 and theta 2 so that we can predict what is the next word that is more likely to be used. And so we want to do this now to find what is a value that maximizes the probability of, of word of observing a specific word with wj plus one given that we observe wj. <clears throat> and then we have to compare this with the what we actually observe in the text. Now of course we can't just say we're picking the largest value of this probability distribution over all the words and saying if we get the right answer this is correct, we count it as a win. If we get the wrong answer, we count it as a loss. Right? Because this isn't giving us much information, especially in the beginning. Right? Because we, the beginning, when you start to train the model, you'll be wrong most of the time. So you want to be able to nudge the system a little bit. Now, the way to measure uh, <clears throat> distance between, between two probabilities is called the, the cross entropy. And in, and in fact, here you have to remember that we are, in fact, comparing two probability distributions. We have the probability wk given by wj, and you have the one-hot encoding of the context, which you can think as being a probability distribution that has, uh, that is uh, completely localized in a specific case. Like it doesn't have various values, it has probability one in one specific case, probability zero everywhere else. And the cross entropy measures the distance in the, in the number of bits between two probability distributions, u, p, and q. And, and you can think of this as, as a way of how can you represent uh, P in the language of Q. Uh, and the way, so just do uh, the sum over all, over all the components of these vectors of P of K times the logarithm of P of K. So which in our case, when we put in our values, becomes this, the, the sum over all the K of, of the components, WJ of J plus one, times the, log, the logarithm of P of WK over WK. And of course, since we know that WJ plus one is one not encoded, what this means is we keep only one element of this sum, right? the element that corresponds to the, to the one value in, the, in our one hot encoded vector. And, and we call this our error function. Right? So this is how far we are from, from the results. So this is how we can Improve. This will give us an idea of if we're improving in our learning or not. But then, of course, now the next question is how, how can we use this as a way of updating the value of theta 1 and theta 2 
So how can we use this as a way of training our network? And the way to do it is gradient descent. Right? So this is a standard way of training neural networks. You're starting at a given point and you're finding basically the, what is the gradient. So what is the slope of the curve at that point? And you're doing this at the end of each batch of training. And then you take a step downhill along the direction of the gradient, right? So you want to go, you want to minimize it, so you're going down the hill. And that's why you put the minus sign over there. And then you're updating basically your position. So then your, your parameter values here, I'm representing uh, theta and n to represent some element of one of the theta matrices, either theta one or theta two. Uh, so the new theta mn value is the old theta mn value minus alpha, the derivative, the great, this component of the gradient, so the derivative of your error function with respect to this specific value. And alpha is the step size, so it's how, how large a step you're taking. And of course, it should be clear that if you if you take a step that's too large, you can get run into trouble. If you take a step that's, that's too small, you will not be efficient. And you keep repeating this until convergence. And your convergence, of course, is in, in quotation marks because you have to define what convergence means. In most, in most cases, what you mean by the is that you are not improving anymore, right? You are you could make these changes, but you're improving very little each time. So the chain rule, <laughs> sorry, the animation got a little bit off. So, so, but how can we calculate this thing? Because in, in effect, what we have is a derivative of H, the function of these element, matrix elements, but these matrix elements are, not, are actually not in our expression. I, uh, I'm reminding you that Theta mn is just one matrix element of one of the theta matrix. And now we're rewriting the, prob the conditional prob probability and in back into our softmax form, and then we're expanding it. But then, and then we remember after we do this expansion simplification that this, this product of vectors, the UK uh, transpose times uh, Vj is actually the sum over uh, matrix components of these two matrices. Right? And after you put that, then you finally have an expression where that explicitly includes the theta k, the, the matrix elements of the theta matrix. Then all you have to do is basically remember apply the chain rule. I won't go into, into the details because it's get boring, no not very, very useful, and then running out of time, I think. <clears throat> uh, so, but you just have to take the logarithm, the, the derivative of the logarithm with respect to its argument, and then the derivative of the argument with respect to these matrix elements and expand. Unfortunately, there are uh, very good tools that can do this automatically for you. So, and that's basically how you train the model. Right? So, you, have, you use uh, the gradient descent using this specific uh, loss function and, and this representation of, of the, the, the neural network as a way of learning these parameters, the total one and the bigger two, the embedding of the words and the embedding of the content. <clears throat> and now we want to go from the, of the simple case into the more general case where we have larger windows. <clears throat> one thing that's important to keep in, in mind and the way you, you do this mapping is the theta two is actually the same for all complex words. And so you, you're not training different complex embeddings for, for different contexts. Words. And, and what this means is, in effect, you're using the average cross entropy and as, a, as the error function, so taking the average over the different guesses. <clears throat> so you're trying to maximize at the same time all the possible, all the possible words that can appear next to it without um, taking into account the order in which they appear. And the word, because the word order, of course, is not important, but it doesn't matter what order you take you sum the elements of the average, the average value is still the same. For the continuous bag of words, the process is essentially the same. You just have to go again through the calculation, but unfortunately, you do not have time to, to show you everything. <clears throat> just go through the calculations and flipping um, uh, indexes and var variations. Mm. So one of the variations people come up with is hierarchical softmax. Turns out that since you have to do calculate the softmax over all the, the words in your vocabulary, this is extremely slow and extremely inefficient. And you can have 50,000 words, 100,000 words, a million words. So if you have to do this at each step, it becomes very painful. Uh, one of the 
multi physical ways of doing it is called hierarchical softmax. And here you're basically approximating the softmax using a binary tree. Right? So, and instead of calculating the value of the exponential for each word in your, in your vocabulary, you're just calculating it for log 2v of the word. So you just have to go down the tree and taking care of all the probabilities along the way. Another variation is ne negative sampling. And you basically undersample the most frequent words by removing them from the text before you generate the context. So you start with, with your text originally. You go through the text, you calculate some statistics on the words, the frequency of each word. And then you decide how to eliminate the most common words. And so you, and you just remove them from the text completely. So this is a similar idea that what you do with the removing stop words in other natural language processing applications. And the justification being that very frequent words tend to be less informative. And this effectively makes the window larger, right? Because you're removing words, so you're, you're picking up words from the, uh, further away and bringing them closer. So it's almost as if your window is, is larger, which of course will increase your, your accuracy, will increase the amount of information your algorithm is, is capable of um, observing. So let's finalize our discussion of to back with just some comments. Even in the original formulation, it's actually not an algorithm, it's a family of algorithms, because you can have uh, either skip grammar or continuous type of words, you can use either for softmax or not, you can use negative sampling or not, and different combinations are out. The output of this neural network is deterministic, right? So it's after you, you, you set the value of theta one and theta two, this the output is, is completely defined. And this means that if two words appear in the same context, like blue and red in our example before, they will have similar internal representations of theta one and theta two, right? Because if you want to get, it's a linear network, it's a deterministic network. So if you want to get a result that is close, that is close, you need to start with an input that is also close, right? if it makes sense. And the theta one and theta two are, are vector embeddings of the input words in the context of the vector, respectively. Of course, words that are too rare are also removed. So words that appear only once or twice, you, you remove them as well, because they're not useful. They might be typos, they might be not relevant in general. Uh, and even in the original implementation of Nikolov, there was actually a dynamic window size. So instead of keeping the window, the window fixed, but for each word, you would choose the, the window size somewhere between one and k, where k is the maximum window size. So in this simple example, with just two words, one, one before and one after, you could, in some, for some words, you would have just a word after, sometimes you have two words before, sometimes you have both words. So some online resources, I'll go through these very quickly. You have the, the original C implementation. You have two very good uh, TensorFlow implementations that are actually part of the TensorFlow tutorials. And the, it has both a, mini, a very minimalist one that just explains the things very, very carefully. And the more efficient one that uses more sophisticated features of TensorFlow. And then there's also the, the GenSyn implementation. That's also one of the standard ones easy to use. And the pre-training embeddings, if you go to this GitHub account, uh, Facebook a, a few months ago, I think it was very recently, re uh, <coughs> released basically uh, word embedding, high quality word embeddings for 90 different languages uh, using Wikipedia. Now, the reason why everybody was excited about work to vector you know, is not because you can get vectors of words. There's other ways of getting vectors out of words. But it's this, this important detail. The, the embedding of each word is actually it's a function of the context it appears in, right? And as, as we saw already, words that appear in similar context, you have similar embeddings. Right? The context is the same, the input is the same. So if you want the output to be the same, the input has to be similar as well. And this, of course, matches the, the distributional hypothesis I mentioned before that we, we know the world by the company. <clears throat> and, and somewhat an intended consequence of this is that the geometric relation between contexts implies semantic relations between words. Right? And, uh, let's make this a little bit clearer. So here I have a, I have a few words. I'm representing this in some arbitrary space that would be part of the embedding, let's say. And in one case, you have the country context, and in the other case, you have the capital context. 
And you can see that the difference between to go from one context to the other is more or less constant across all the other words. Right? The distance to go between Paris and France is the same to go between Rome and Italy, Portugal and Lisbon, etc. And what this means is that you can do this type of analogies. And this is what made everybody pay attention to what to vec is that these vectors, despite the simplicity of the network you're using and the way you're training it, it's very simple. You're able to do things like this. You're able to say, if you pick, if you grab the vector, and here sigma represents the, the vector embedding of that specific word. So sigma of France, the vector embedding of France, minus the, the vector of Paris, plus the vector of Rome, gives you the vector of Italy. Right? And what this means is basically that the context, the distance between France and Paris is the same as the distance between Rome and Italy. <laughs> And, and you can see this in, in this visualization. This is actually from the TensorFlow tutorial. And you can, if you look carefully, unfortunately, the, the letters are, are very small. You can look in some areas, you'll see very clearly that there are very related words there. So for instance, in the, more or less in the, in the center, towards the top, you see one, two, three. So you see the numbers a little bit further down, almost in the center as well, you see could, must, would, so will, so that type of words, and if you explore more carefully, you will see some uh, other patterns as well. Now, let's go briefly into some applications of what effect that people have come up with. This is one of my favorites. It's called statistic, uh, it's from a paper in 2015 called Statistically Significant Detection of Linguistic Change. And, and what they did was basically trained word embeddings for different years using Google Books. Google Books just gives you statistics for each year how many times a specific word or a sequence of two words, a sequence of three words, a sequence of four words, I think even five words, it goes up to, to five grams, appeared in, in, book, in published books in their uh, scanned data set. Okay. They trained uh, embeddings for each, uh, I think it was a period of five years, if I'm not mistaken. And this gave them independent, uh, basically independent, uh, word embeddings, that then they had to match, right? We're initializing the the, the theta one that gives it to matrices randomly in the beginning, and then we're writing them train. What this means is that there will be a shift between different uh, different trainings, even over the, over the same corpus, right? So you have to align, and this shift is basically an arbitrary rotation in arbitrary dimensions. So, you, but if you align them, you can get the words to match, Right, to find the, you need to find the right direction, get them to match, and then you can use this to track how the meanings of words is changing over time. Right? And here you have the, the example that they give in the cover of the paper of how the word gay has evolved over time. So it started as, as meaning courageous or healthy or, or courteous or dapper, so well, good looking. And then it gradually evolved to more towards homosexual and lesbian as the use of the word changed. Not, not, not to back is also uh, a very good uh, application of, the, of this idea is this, the idea is very simple. Right? You can think of the sequence of words as being a path on the graph of words, right? where you connect words based on whether they're next to each other or not. And if you can think of a text as being a network, why can't you think of a network as being a text? Right? And instead of learning embeddings for words, you're learning embedding for the nodes and, the, and embeddings that somehow capture some some uh, feature of the network structure right? and that you can use to measure similarity between nodes. So they do this in, in a couple of different ways. The features, of course, so the way you're walking through the network will, will depend on the way you're walking through the network. So they tried first a uh, breadth search and depth for search. They found that breadth for search explores only very limited neighborhoods, which gives you some type of structural equivalence. Depth uh, first search explores neighborhoods and covers homophilic communities, not homophiles communities. And then they, they develop their own uh, bias random walk where at each step, the walker basically decides to go back to the, where it just came from or to keep moving forward in specific ways. And in this way, they were able to interpolate between the two cases. Finally, just very quickly, this is actually my favorite version or variation on word to back is actually dna to back And this was basically word to back applied to KMR sequences, so sequences of nucleotides in, in DNA. And they found that 
the cosine similarity, so the of the vector of the embeddings of each kernel, actually match to the similarity score used in, in bio, bioinformatics as a way of analyzing and aligning nucleotide sequences. So you can actually match uh, multiple pieces of, of uh, DNA that you're sequencing independently. So this is all I have today. I think I'm slightly late already. Let me see if I have any questions. Uh, both the natural embedding and the one embedding has no distance meaning, so it's not an advancement for natural embedding. Yes, this is true. Uh, sound quality is not great, I'm sorry. Any slides, I will post them. Uh, I need to clean up some of, the, some of them, as you saw. As well to write being deployed to identify relationships between concepts. So far as I think support to establish relationships to facts. Uh, Maybe, and I think I understand, if I understand correctly, you can kind of think of concepts as being context in a sense, right? So words that are synonyms are somehow very strongly related will tend to appear in the same context. And you can also combine different words as a way of, of representing paragraphs or entire documents. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to cover those. Uh, Next question, how can one use word embeddings to represent arbitrary length text documents as a fixed length vector to use as input to a neural network classifier? Averaging the word vectors doesn't sound very good. Is there a better way? Uh, this is actually one of the ways they do it. So they, they average the word vectors. What that means is basically that you're disregarding the word order. There are algorithms called doc to vec and paragraph to vec, I think, that actually do this explicitly and do it in a, in a more sophisticated way. I can look up the references and add them to the presentation if you like. Uh, what can be a role of someone choosing the embedding size? There doesn't seem to be any fixed rules. The, what I've seen is most of the time, the, the embedding size or the embedding dimension, the size of the hidden layer, is between two and 300, sometimes 500. And this is for vocabulary sizes of 50,000 or more. If you want to represent multiple words in one vector, then you put them model with one per word representation. How would you do that? So this is similar to the question above, I think. And one of the simplest ways is to, to just average the, the word vectors. Uh, can you comment on doctor back and phrase to back? Yeah, just I mentioned them above. What are the challenges involved in using them? So they're, they're a little bit more sophisticated because they're, like uh, I mentioned above, they're trying to combine, uh, or rather, they're, they're trying to find a uh, fixed length representation of the <clears throat> of, a, of a variable length piece of text so it has to use some type of approximation in the case of paragraph to vec for example they they use the, an averaging of the different words and they use a paragraph id that kind of tends to tilt things in one direction or the other uh, is it a good idea to train the word to vec on documents from specific area or just use the pre-trained ones so here you would have the problem I mentioned in, in the beginning. If your if your data set is too small, you will pick up on things that maybe are not what you want to pick up. And so you might have you're more likely to have spurious correlations, which is why people use this for or rather used to, to train these with as, as large a corpus as they can get their hands on, usually Wikipedia or something even larger. Um, <clears throat> One reason why you might want to train it in your own data set is if you were trying to capture specific meanings of words that are characteristic to your data set, and maybe not the generic, so some type of jargon, for example. And that might, and there it might be useful, but it depends on your application. Uh, do, it, do I teach an online course that goes into more detail? Uh, not yet, I'm working on it. Uh, if you're in New York City, I think maybe in June, there will be a meetup where I will present this in in more lengths, I will even go through the 
the TensorFlow implementations and explain exactly what, what it's doing. And I believe in September, I will be in, in San Francisco at the O'Reilly AI conference, and there will be a three-hour talk where I'll go in, into a lot of detail of the implementation and the different things. So hopefully I'll, I'll see you guys there, either in New York or in San Francisco. Uh, do I ever come to Toronto? I don't think I've ever been there. <laughs> I will be in, in Montreal in a couple of weeks for ICWSM. Uh, can you comment a little bit more on applications of node to back? Could we say encode networks learn from data and cluster encode them? By example, how do nodes behave interact with one another? Yes, I mean, that's exactly the, the, the idea behind node to back. You're trying to understand what are the relations between the nodes and you and you want to do this based on, based on data. So the, they didn't have data on the interactions between the nodes, so they, they came up with these interesting random walk algorithms to see what the algorithm was, captured, was capable of capturing. This is also always good to, <clears throat> when you're starting to understand something, you start with something that you already know and you see if it matches what you expect. So they started with algorithms that are very well known, that for search, that for search, and even these simple random walks. <clears throat> but if you have data on how two nodes are empirically interacting with each other, either from Twitter, from Wikipedia, from people uh, calling each other on cell phones, etc. then you can use that. Uh, great talk, thank you. How can you change some embedding representation selectively for our domain? Uh, I think you need to, to just train a, a model. I mean, that's no, I don't think there's any other way. Uh, did you say I'll be at Element AI in Montreal? No, I will be at uh, ICWSM, which is International Conference on Weblogs and Data Mining. No, Weblogs and Social Media. So. And that will be on the week of May 15th. Have you come across patent text analysis libraries in Python? Uh, I have not. What are your thoughts on word to back versus Blob? Uh, I think they're very similar. Blob was basically created as a reaction to word to back as a way of trying to find embeddings that are somehow more empirically based and that you can understand better where they're coming from because they're, you're setting this distance between the between the, the vectors and this relation between the vectors by hand and then you're optimizing that so i think they're they're similar i don't think i've ever compared them directly like can you do the analogy game as well with Glove as you can with work to back. I'm sure there are papers with that who have done it. I haven't really looked into it too much because I'm I'm interested specifically in the way work to back works, which is why I've been looking at it in, in, a, in a lot of detail. So I think that's the last question. So if nobody else has any questions, thank you again for listening to me. If you have any more questions, you can reach me on my email address or, or via Twitter. And thank you again. Bye.